From the nation's capital in Washington, D.C., Cole on Congress. The program discussing national issues that affect Oklahoma. Your host, U.S. Representative Tom Cole. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Cole on Congress. Today I'm pleased to welcome Congressman Scott Tipton to the program. Scott's entering his second term in Congress. He represents uh, the third congressional district in that state. That includes Pueblo, Grand Junction, Durango, lots of uh, western Colorado. Uh, serves on the House Committee on Small Business, Natural Resources, and the Ag Committee. Scott, it's great to have you here. And I usually like to start out with a a little uh, story, and I remember actually the very first time you ran. We never had the opportunity to meet, uh, but you were running a tough race against an incumbent uh, out there. And I think election night, uh, you were in the middle 40s, and I remember a lot of us thinking we should have invested more money <laughs> out there. And then, you know, came back again, took the seat, and have held it. Uh, and that was a very tough campaign. So uh, thanks for running. Thanks for winning. Well, I'll tell you, you know, as we hear from our part of the world out in the West, uh, you know, these issues are so critically important to our children, to our grandchildren, the, the country our, our kids are going to inherit. And so uh, it's a great honor to be able to serve with you and uh, to be able to see your leadership here as well. It's the other way around. Before you were here, I was sitting in the minority. Now you've put us in the majority, you and your class, and uh, have really begun to honestly shape uh, and reshape Congress, I think, in a very, very positive way. I mean, you really changed the nature of the Republican conference, made it tougher, smarter, more conservative, and frankly better. And uh, uh, so thanks for running. Thanks for running twice. That's a real, uh, that's a real testament to character and fortitude. <laughs> uh, if, if not for you, at least for your spouse. So uh, let me ask you this. You're on the Ag Committee. Uh, you know, my colleague and very good friend and the senior member of our delegation, uh, Frank Lucas, chairs that committee. I know you guys struggled last year, got a bipartisan bill put together, got it ready to go to the floor. We never had the opportunity to bring it up. So, and, and in my district, they really care about farming and agriculture. So give me your overview of where we're at on uh, whether or not we can get an agricultural bill and what do you think the main issues sure. will be in that? You know, uh, what we're probably going to be doing, Tom, is we'll be using the bill that we passed last year, and it certainly wasn't a perfect bill. Uh, none that ever come out <laughs> of this uh, uh, institution are. Uh, but we'll be using that as a basis. In fact, I just visited with Chairman Lucas uh, just about an hour ago. Uh, in that, we're going to be using that as the basis. We will not see an extension uh, of the farm bill. I believe we will bring a, a bill to the floor. We'll go through regular order uh, in the Ag Committee. Uh, it'll be marked up once again. It'll probably be a little bit different, uh, but very similar to the bill that we passed out last year. It will then go to the floor. It will not be under a closed rule. Uh, so we can expect amendments on the floor of the House of Representatives, which can certainly alter it. But I think that we will seek that solution. I, I think it's critically important uh, for our farm and ranch communities, 97% uh, of which are small businesses uh, in this country. Uh, the, we need to be able to have some real certainty uh, to be able to deliver what I view as part of our national security program, and that's our ability to be able to feed the nation. You know, we're losing about a million acres per year right now growing townhomes and condos, yet the American farmer, the American rancher is able to feed this country and a good part of the world. Uh, we've got to make sure that we're allowing those families to be able to continue that production. And I'm going to be a big proponent as we move forward as well to make sure they can stay on the family farm when we're looking at the death tax. Well, as many as you certainly know, and certainly anybody involved in agriculture does, but many people don't, a huge portion of that bill, something like two-thirds to three-quarters, really isn't farming at all. It's urban right. nutrition programs, everything from food stamp to WIC to you name it. Uh, and I know that's been an area of concern because of just the sheer growth and the size of some of those programs in the time we've had deficit. Does this bill, or do you envision a bill that will have reforms and changes in those kind of areas? And if so, what are the things that you think will You know, we'd certainly occur? address the SNAP program, Supplemental Nutritional Program, uh, in the last Farm Bill. We didn't achieve the savings that we would have liked to because there were actually a lot of administrative costs that we could have cut out of that program without harming the ultimate good of being able to feed people who are in actual sure. need. 
we weren't quite successful in achieving all we wanted, but we did have some real gains. I think we had something like $35 billion total savings that we were going to be having out of the Farm Bill. Uh, we are going to address that. We've had a lot of conversation. It would be terrific to actually to be able to have a real Farm Bill that just deals with farm issues and we deal with the nutrition end of it, the supplemental end of it, with a separate piece of legislation. Uh, there's obviously uh, some, some people that like to be able to wed those two together, uh, but that would probably be the most desirable end of it. When we're looking at 47 million Americans right now uh, that are receiving food stamps, it speaks to a number of things. We've got to make sure that we're getting Americans primarily back to work so that they don't need these programs. Of course, the concern on that has always been, and I'd love your take on it, uh, somebody that, that knows the, uh, the issue, uh, that if you don't have this rather odd pairing, that you won't get the votes out of the urban area you need from the farm programs, and you might not get the votes out of the rural areas that you need for the nutrition programs. Frankly, I've always thought you would get the votes from the rural. Look, people don't want in this country don't want it, you know folks to go hungry, and uh, we're by nature a generous, uh, generous people. Uh, but I do worry sometimes that, uh, and I know some of the farmers and ranchers, well, farmers primarily, obviously that I represent are concerned, they don't like having it there, and yet they think, gosh, will anybody from New York City vote for the farm program absent uh, this, so. You know, and it is, it's, it's very interesting. It's one of the great values, I think, of being able to have the, the high privilege of being in Washington. Uh, you learn the issues that affect people in New York City, and uh, you're hopeful, and it's part of your job coming out of Oklahoma, and mine coming out of Colorado, uh, to be able to educate uh, our fellow citizens from the East Coast about the issues that are going to be important for us. And we share a very common value. I think uh, the folks that we represent, we do everything we possibly can to try and understand these other issues. None of us would have any American go hungry or go cold in the winter as far as that goes. Uh, and just trying to be able to bring common sense to the process. What do you see uh, on, again, staying with the Farm Bill for just a little bit longer, but. Uh, there were also, I know, in the original bill, some, some pretty big sacrifices for rural America, the end of direct uh, right. uh, support and that, that sort of thing. Are those type of things likely to survive, and what, uh, what economies can be achieved right. on that side of the ledger? You know, I think on the direct support, uh, that's obviously when uh, Debbie Stabenow, you know, has spoken to that mm -hmm. point uh, that, you know, it's very difficult to be able to defend. For, our, for our viewers and listeners, she's the Democratic Senate chairman of their agriculture committee in, right. the, in the Senate. And I visited with her actually about a month ago on this, and I think a lot of our farmers and ranchers are, are pleased to have that opportunity, and uh, again, they're approaching it with common sense. They know that we have to be able to give in some areas. They understand the $16.5 trillion debt that we have in this country, and our farm and ranch communities are willing to be able to do their part, but they can't be the sole scapegoat either. And so uh, I think when we're looking at insurance, uh, you know, some of the uh, insurance as, uh, as a replacement for some of the direct payments, I, I'm hopeful that those issues will actually survive. Not being on the Ag Committee itself, are you drawn in, because agriculture is such an important part of our trade uh, overseas, great, uh, great uh, balance of payment advantage for the United States. And, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, in Oklahoma, we literally export something like 80% of our wheat beyond the right. continental United States. So, right. international markets uh, for us, and hopefully, and we export cattle and other things as well. Very, very important. It is. You know, the three trade agreements that we passed last year uh, with South Korea, with Colombia, with Panama, uh, I think are fine examples of our ability to be able to expand those markets for the American farmer, the American rancher. Uh, we've got a lot of other opportunities in the world as well uh, to be able to expand that beef market into Japan and over into Russia. Uh, this is something that I think when we're looking at export, it's a great area when we're looking at the trade deficit of this country to look at that shiny example of success that we have, our farm and ranch community. You know, a lot of people think uh, when you're dealing with a trade issue, I, I, people, Americans just have this intuitive belief, somehow we're suckers and we lose every trade agreement. I was actually uh, a couple years ago in um, Colombia, and before the Colombian Free Trade Agreement had passed, they were very supportive of it, but mm -hmm. President Santos, I might add, a 1972 graduate of the University of Kansas, so he knows uh -huh. something about, uh, about our part of the world, uh, made the point. He said, you know, we really want this agreement. We think it's going to be good for both our countries, but I have a lot of resistance myself from farmers 
uh, and ranchers in Colombia that are very worried about competing uh, directly, you know, with a very efficient, robust, and high quality American agriculture industry. It is, you know, uh, agriculture isn't the farmer on the back of a tractor with a sunburn anymore. These are high tech operations, high yield operations. Uh, the investments, you have the uh, University of Oklahoma uh, in, in your district. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have uh, CSU, uh, Fort Lewis College in my district, uh, Colorado, uh, Mesa University. All of these areas, in terms of what we're able to provide education-wise and research-wise for our farm and ranch community to be able to enhance the productivity that we see coming out of our fields, uh, is a great text uh, for American success and American ingenuity. Well, I want to pull you to another area of expertise. Now you're you're on the Natural Resources Committee. I had the privilege of sitting a couple terms on there. It's actually one of the most interesting committees in Congress yes. because you know, the federal government owns 20% of the land in the country and the uh, biggest landlord, the amount of minerals type things that, that it owns. Tell me what are the major issues that you grapple with on that committee that you see us occupying ourselves with next couple of years? You know, what we really have to achieve uh, is energy security in this country. Um, we have an abundant amount of resources on our public lands. In my congressional district, on the west slope of Colorado, 70% of the land, 70% of the land out of 54,000 square miles is either federal, state, or tribal lands. Uh, abundant resources real, are there, and we can responsibly develop these resources. In fact, we just had the governor of Colorado, uh, we've, we've all heard about the fracking issue. Uh, it's coming out, which has unleashed incredible energy potential in this country in terms of natural gas to be able to fuel power plants and to ultimately to be able to drive our fleet vehicles and cars down the road at very affordable prices. Uh, our Democrat Governor John Hickenlooper pointed out in testimony just a couple of days ago in Washington that he drank the fracking fluid. Uh, <laughs> really? He did. Uh, <laughs> it, it is actually. I got to uh, get that from my website. <laughs> you do. Uh, you know, it's actually uh, a benign. That being said, we need to make sure that we're doing it safe. Sure. And Colorado is actually, uh, I think, a standard bearer for doing it right. Uh, we have the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission. And I agree with our governor. It needs to be applied at the state level rather than a one size fits all out of the federal government. So let's develop those resources. I've introduced a piece of legislation called Planning for America's Energy Future Act. And what this is going to do is to require the Secretary of Interior working with the Secretary uh, of Agriculture to actually go in, look at the 30-year estimated needs of our country when it comes to energy needs, and th then develop a four-year plan to be able to responsibly extract these resources out of American soil to be able to create American jobs, to be able to put Americans back to work, and to be able to create American energy certainty. What are the challenges that we're facing there? It's a lot of regulations uh, that are coming out of Washington, D.C. Uh, Secretary Salazar, who is now leading this administration, uh, has inhibited a lot of our ability, not only on our coastal waters, uh, but in terms of our, our land mass as well, to unleash America's energy potential and to be able to do it in a responsible way. I happen to know those folks. They're mm -hmm. friends and neighbors. They have dirt under their fingernails. Their families live there. They love the land. They uh, want to be able to protect our water and our air because they live there. We can do this responsibly, but it is rules and regulations coming out of Washington that are inhibiting that American prosperity and to be able to put Americans back to work. Uh, in my two largest communities, and you noted them at the opening, Pueblo, Colorado and Grand Junction, Colorado, in those two counties, the real unemployment number is hovering around 20%. Uh, we have families that are suffering right now without need. They don't want a government check. They want a paycheck. Let's put them back to work and let's pass the Keystone Pipeline. Oh, as gosh. As on the way. I couldn't agree more. Well, this whole energy uh, you know, revolution holds the key to so much of our future. The, the things are obvious. You're from an oil and gas state like I am, so of course we see that. Uh, but the definition of who oil and gas states are is changing dramatically. Sure. It's actually one of the things that excites and concerns me, excites me because all of a sudden, uh, you know, there's 17,000 new jobs in western Pennsylvania that weren't mm -hmm. there five years ago. They pay over $70,000 a piece looking for natural gas, developing it. Uh, you see the chemical industry returning to the United States because of cheap natural gas, manufacturing advantages, uh, and, exactly. you know, look, when you're drilling, uh, that's a lot of steel, uh, that's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, cement, that's a lot of different 
uh, items that get used. So it's it's actually just keying an American uh, manufacturing renaissance as well as an American energy renaissance. And uh, this, the importance of sustaining this and the danger of the federal government over-regulating it, right. stifling it is, I think, uh, you know, really can't be overstated. You know, it can't. You know, when we put on our, our broader vision and, and we look at, look at it from the 30,000 foot view, a lot of the world's energy right now is coming out of the Middle East. Uh, we've obviously got uh, real problems that are going on in Syria right now. It's starting to spill over into yeah. Turkey. Uh, Jordan is stable, but we have the Islamic Brotherhood in charge of Egypt right now. Uh, we have the Iranians uh, just about uh, to, to develop a nuclear weapon. They have their navy at sea. We have something called the Suez Canal, uh, which channels down through Egypt. Uh, the world's oil supply may well be challenged in the very near future. So in the interests of our country, uh, in the interests of world trade and, and, and prosperity, I think it uh, benefits us to be able to responsibly develop these resources here, to be able to look at some of the opportunities with the abundance that you note now, not just coming out of Oklahoma and Colorado and some of the western states, but out of Pennsylvania, out of New York, out of a variety of different sources with new responsible technologies, to even be able to export this over to our European counterparts right now who are relying on a very uh, questionable government that is run by Mr. Putin in Russia. Uh, we can create those jobs and create those trading opportunities and make sure we've got that reliable, affordable resource right here at home. Well, I want to drag you into another area on your committee that I know you know a lot more about than I do, and that's forest. You've been a real leader in uh, managing and thinking through what we do with our forest lands, which again are abundance. So if you can, sort of talk a little bit about some of the problems that we face, challenges, and some of the legislative solutions you've been working on. You bet. You know, in our forests right now in the West, uh, we've been plagued by the bark beetle e epidemic, which has gone through and ravaged forests. You probably heard about some of the tremendous wildfires that we had um, taking lives, destroying homes and property in Colorado just this last year. But the entire West is subject to this. We've got to be able to have a policy to be able to go in and responsibly manage these forests. And I've introduced legislation called the Healthy Forest Management and Wildfire Act. What this bill is going to do is to be able to get it back home. I'm a big believer that nobody cares and loves more for the land than the people who actually live there. This legislation would actually empower our governors to be able to work with our local county commissioners to be able to go in and identify areas of imminent threat around schools, around our water supplies, uh, around homes, and to be able to go in uh, and clear those areas, not clear cutting, but just going in and responsibly treating those forests uh, to make sure that wildfire is not going to be a challenge uh, in the future. And it's a bill that I'm hoping that we're going to be able to pass through Congress before the next wildfire season actually comes upon us in the next couple of months. Uh, this is critical to be able to protect our watersheds in the West, to be able to protect property and to be able to protect lives. Let's empower and entrust our governors and our county commissioners, people who love and know the land the very best, to be able to make some of those responsible decisions. Uh, it's also something that's good for education. Uh, you know, I give a, a, a real kudo to our chairman, Doc Hastings, in Natural Resources. He has a bill for the secure rural schools to be able to go in, and this is a crop effectively with some of the trees. We can grow more with responsible forest management. Those resources then coming off have been able to fund some of the schools with the vast public lands that we have out west. So I think the combination of these two bills is going to help education, it's going to help the health of the forest, and it's going to be able to address fires and to be able to protect property, lives, and the watershed of the west. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's a remarkably important thing. No more now than, as you point out, uh, with the threat of drought, and this is an enormous resource for us. And, uh, to not manage it properly. I think some people want to just simply let it set all by itself as if, uh, you know, that uh, that's better for it. But uh, responsible thinning, responsible management, uh, very critical to the health of the forest itself. You know, it really is. Uh, I went out and toured near Pagosa Springs in my district. Uh, I have a gentleman out there named J.R. Ford. He was given a contract by the Forest Service to be able to go in and do what is called a treatment, to do some thinning. And as you know, a very important point that we often don't pay a lot of attention to uh, in drought is competing uh, foliage 
that's going after a very limited supply of water. So when we allow these forests literally to be able to overgrow, uh, it creates a danger uh, for wildfire and the health of trees. Well, in this pilot project, he went in and treated an area and I was able to tour this and uh, looked like just a beautiful, pristine forest. Uh, the grass and flowers were probably about knee high. Mm -hmm. Great forage for the elk and the deer. Adequate hiding areas, you know, for some of the smaller animals. If we turn around 180 degrees, just about 100 yards behind us, was an untreated area of the forest. Now to my untrained eye, it looked great, it was beautiful, but it was completely overgrown. The forest ranger there pointed out to me, he said the Forest Service has had a fallacy uh, for the last number of years, failing to be able to treat these forests, and we had trees growing at elevation which shouldn't be there, uh, which has caused some of the o overgrowth. If we went, go in and treat those forests, we actually increase the groundwater by 20%. Uh, ask the question, how long does a tree have to take uh, to become healthy again once that water is available? Only about two weeks. So we can create a lot wow. of win-wins. Uh, once this area is taken off of this pilot project, it gets put to beneficial use. It's actually going to become a biofuel uh, to be able to generate electricity for the small community around Pagosa Springs. So we can create these win-wins, and I think that ought to be our objective. Uh, not to the exclusion of one, uh, to the benefit of another, but let's create those win-win opportunities. I think the Healthy Forest Management Bill and proper forest management uh, are good positive steps in that direction. Well, one of the things your district and mine uh, have in common is a substantial Native American population yeah. and uh, you know groups of tribal governments. You have a rather unique background in this yourself. I'd like uh, you to, to to tell our viewers and listeners about, uh, if you would. And then uh, tell us a little bit about the nature of the tribal economies in your area and some of the issues in natural resources has jurisdiction over a wide range of, of issues that relate to Native American governments, tribal governments. So give us a little view of what you're involved in there. Sure. Yeah, I had the uh, great opportunity really graduating from college. I started my own business in Cortez, Colorado. And employed members of the Ute Navajo tribes and actually made things from dirt to finished product and uh, made pottery, we did a little bit of jewelry, expanded that out to where we carried uh, Native American arts from throughout the Southwest. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, some out of Oklahoma. Oh, well, good. And uh, even sold Oklahoma, which Colorado <laughs> liked as well. Uh, but it was a great opportunity to be able to work with people that I had grown up with and gone to school with. And uh, it's also given me a, a good opportunity to be able to, to work and get to know you. I really appreciate your leadership on the Native American Caucus. Oh, you. uh, you've, you've carried this flag, on, I think, on something that's very important to both of us. Uh, we've got to be able to keep those commitments uh, that we have made to our tribal communities. I have the Ute Mountain Ute and the Southern Ute tribe that are in my district, the only two tribes officially in Colorado. Uh, and there are very interesting studies in terms of even some of the, the diversity of terrain. When we look at the Southern Ute tribe, uh, on a per capita basis actually, they're among the wealthiest people in the entire United States. They have a lot of oil and gas. Guess what? They're having the same problem that we're having throughout the rest of the country when it comes to federal regulations in terms of responsibly developing those resources. These are people that I guarantee you love and care about the land and love and care about their people as well and want to be able to provide good livings and good jobs. So we're trying to help navigate through some of those issues. When we step over to the Ute Mountain Ute tribe, uh, there isn't quite as much oil and gas that's over there, but great farmlands mm -hmm. which they're developing, uh, encouraging Native American arts to be able to carry on some of the traditions that are there. Uh, and thanks actually to the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe and to the Southern Ute Tribe as well with the fulfillment of some of our water compacts. In Southwest Colorado, we ha now have the Night Horse Reservoir named after former Senator U.S. Uh, US Senator Ben Night Horse Campbell and then McPhee Reservoir in my home county in Montezuma County, which is providing a lot of water to be able to grow our communities and to be able to help our farm and ranch communities as well. Well, I tell you, uh, the Southern Utes actually came in and testified before the uh, uh, Interior Appropriations Subcommittee. We actually, we hold three or four days of open testimony so any Indian tribe mm -hmm. in the country can come in with their, their problems. And their problem was exactly like any uh, energy company would have operating on federal land. They talked about how slow the permitting process was and how, they, uh, frankly, they wanted uh, more control over their own 
uh, area, and uh, so they could spur development. They thought they could make it happen a lot quicker and, and had a whole list of actually very thoughtful suggestions as mm -hmm. to how the regulatory environment could be changed in ways that encouraged development. Because they live under a federal regulatory regime, the state regime is actually more advantageous, and that's generally right. the pattern. I mean, the, the fees are higher, the waits are longer, uh, right. uh, the federal government is not a very good manager of, of mineral leasing and that sort of thing. Uh, but um, it was interesting to, uh, to get their perspective because it was like talking to a lot of frustrated oil and gas guys in Oklahoma <laughs> City. They, they want to be able to develop the resource they have. Uh, and when you look at the regulatory process, one of the examples that they gave me, they're willing to trade, I think, several hundred acres of their land for the Forest Service for about a quarter of an acre of land so that they don't have to reroute around and destroy more terrain to be able to develop resources which are literally on their land. But the regulatory process is inhibiting that. They're trying to be able to do the right thing to be able to protect the environment and develop those resources in a responsible way. But it's regulatory requirements right now that are inhibiting that. So we have a lot of challenges uh, that our Native American communities are facing, not only in, in Oklahoma and in Colorado as well. And uh, I know you and I both are, are dedicated yeah. to do our best to try and reach out and help. And by the way, I really admire your bracelet and ring <laughs> that you have on there as well. So. Well, thank you. That's the uh, Zuni Indian ring was my great grandfather. So, uh, you know, and that's a lovely piece of work there. So, very good. Uh, let me ask you this. We've got a oh, couple minutes left, and I've, dr I've drug you very deeply down into your areas uh, on your committees, but. You know, we all share issues in common that are genuinely national in scope. And we've got uh, a budget crisis. Uh, we've got uh, sequestration looming. We know we're going to have, uh, after that, to, to write a budget. We're going to have a continuing resolution. We'll eventually have a debt ceiling vote. How do you see those issues unfolding? And, and what are your concerns as you, uh, you know, look ahead as a member of Congress, the, the big national problems and challenges that we have? You know, I think it's absolutely incumbent on us as a Congress uh, to balance this budget and to be able to pay down the debt. You know, this year we're going to be paying $220 billion in just interest payments. In the year 2020, which is now only seven short years away, we're going to be paying $778 billion in just interest. We aren't paying down anything. Can you imagine how many children we could educate with $778 billion, how many roads we could pave with $778 billion, and that ticker is going to continue to run. You know, as uh, you're aware, uh, over the last two years, we have passed a budget in the House two times, and we'll pass a budget again shortly to be able to address this. In the interest of the American people, we've got to be our families around their kitchen tables this morning understand that you can't continue to spend more than you take in. That has to be the legitimate responsibility and it will be the legacy, I think, of this Congress in this time in American history if we're willing to stand up for future generations, for our children and grandchildren. And I think also we'd be a little bit remiss if we didn't note that in that part of the process as well, we have to be standing up for our seniors, and concurrently then our children and grandchildren. And this gets into some programs uh, that do impact uh, our, our budget process here in Washington, and that's Medicare and Social Security. I think all of us have the heart. I know we certainly do on our si side of the aisle. If we made a promise, it's just like with the tribes. Uh, we've got to make sure that we're fulfilling that promise. But we have a further obligation as well to make sure that we are fulfilling the promise and the opportunity for our children and grandchildren. By the president's own numbers, Medicare will go bankrupt in just 10 short years. Well, I'm going to have to uh, break there, but I think our, our, again, viewers and listeners see why you're such a great member of Congress. You know your subjects in detail, and yet you're passionate about the great national issues. and on the right side. I, I just think you're at the beginning of a really brilliant career in Congress. Glad you uh, ran and thanks for coming by the show. Tom, it's my honor to be able to be with you. And thanks. Great to serve with you. Thanks my pleasure. That was a good show. That's All a wrap. Right.